By itself, a DC motor can't be controlled like a servo or stepper, but add an encoder and it can. With this approach, you could harness the simplicity, even torque, and lightweight profile of a DC motor for your controlled application. For this build, you'll need a microcontroller, a DC motor with an encoder, and a motor driver. I'm using an Arduino Uno and a Polulu motor and driver. To read from the encoder, connect the encoder output pins to digital pins with interrupts. For an Uno, that means pins 2 and 3. You also need to connect the encoder to the Arduino ground and 5 volt regulator. An encoder works by observing changes to the magnetic field created by a magnet attached to the motor shaft. As the motor rotates, the encoder outputs will trigger periodically. When the magnet spins clockwise, output A will trigger first. When rotated counterclockwise, on the other hand, output B will trigger first. Let's observe how an encoder works by reading from the encoder outputs. Define the pins connected to the encoder outputs and set them to input mode. In the loop function, read from the encoder. Write the output to the serial line. I multiplied by 5 to make the plot easier to read. Try rotating the encoder magnet. The encoder signals will change rapidly. It's easier to understand the output with the serial plotter, so let's open that. Notice that when I rotate the magnet clockwise, output A is triggered first. Counterclockwise rotations cause output B to trigger first. Now let's measure the position of the motor shaft. First create a global variable for the position. Instead of reading from the encoder inside the loop function, you'll want to attach an interrupt that triggers each time output A rises. The attach interrupt function has three inputs. The interrupt, which is found using the digital pin to interrupt function, the name of a function to call when the interrupt happens, which I've named read encoder, and the trigger type. Inside the loop function, report the current position. The most important piece of this code is the read encoder function, which is called whenever output A triggers an interrupt. Inside the function, read from the other output encoder B. If the magnet rotates clockwise, then the signal B is already high when the interrupt triggers. In this case, add one to the position. In the case where the magnet rotates counterclockwise, signal B is low. In this case, subtract one. Try testing your position measurements by rotating the motor shaft and viewing the output on the serial monitor or plotter. Now that you're reading position measurements from the encoder, you're ready to connect the motor driver. Start by connecting the motor leads to the outputs of the motor driver. The motor driver also needs an appropriate power supply. Next, connect the driver ground to the Arduino ground. The PWM input of the motor driver should be connected to an Arduino PWM pin. Here I've used pin 5. The other two motor driver pins can be connected to any of the remaining Arduino digital pins. Before writing the control algorithm, let's test the motor driver. Start by defining the pins that you connected to the motor driver. It's useful to define a function that will set the motor direction and speed. The interface for the set motor function I've written here sets the direction and speed of a motor with the pins defined in the last three inputs. Inside the function, I've set the speed with an analog write command. If the direction integer is 1, then the motor will rotate one way by writing a high-low combination to the input pins of the driver. If you reverse the order to a low-high combination, the motor will rotate the other direction. Inside the loop function, you can call the set motor function to drive the motor. Also write the position to the serial line so you can observe the motion. As the motor spins, the position variable will update using the encoder readings. So far, we've connected the controller, motor driver, and motor in a loop, but we haven't used the position signal from the encoder to control the motor. To control the motor position, we'll use a feedback loop. In a feedback loop, the controlled components are often referred to as the plant. Here, that's the motor and the motor driver. The sensor that we're using to measure position is the encoder. In order to actually control the position of the motor, you need to provide it with a target position. Then, you take the difference between the target position and the measured position. 
the result is the error, usually written as e of t. Now that the error has been computed, you can use a controller to compute a control signal that is sent to the plant. The control signal is configured so that it will attempt to reduce the error. The control signal is typically written as u of t. In this project, we'll use the PID control algorithm to generate the control signal u of t. The PID control signal is constructed using a sum of three terms, a proportional, derivative, and integral term. That's what PID stands for. The proportional term is the most important, as it is directly responsible for reducing the error. The derivative and integral terms are typically used to smooth out the control system response. The three constants, kp, ki, and kd, determine how strongly each term is represented in the control loop. You can adjust these constants to tune your response. You can estimate the integral and derivative of the error using the simple finite difference approximation shown here. The integral term accumulates the error over time, and the derivative computes how quickly the error is changing. With the feedback control loop complete, you're ready to write code to control the position of the motor. Start by defining global storage variables that can be used to save values between time steps. These are used in the finite difference estimates for the integral and derivative. The first thing that you need to do in the loop function is set a target for the control loop. The control signal will be adjusted over time as the measured position becomes closer to the target. Next, define the constants used in the PID control algorithm. Start by setting kp to 1 and kd and ki to 0. You can come back and adjust these later. To compute the finite difference approximations, we need to compute the time difference delta t. Start by recording the current time in microseconds using the micros function. Then compute delta t in seconds by taking the difference between the current time and the previous time. Be careful that you're performing floating point arithmetic, not integer arithmetic. Complete the calculation by storing the current time in the previous time variable for use in the next iteration of the loop. The error is computed as the difference between the target and measured positions. Here I've reversed the order because of the way that I wired the motor leads. If you find that your control algorithm isn't working, you can try switching the sign of the error term as I did here. Now compute the derivative and integral of the error signal using the finite difference approximations. With all that work done, you're finally ready to compute your control signal. It's surprisingly simple, isn't it? This signal will tell the plant the direction and speed to turn the motor. To send the signal to the motor, we need to convert it into a speed and direction. Start by computing the PWM signal as the floating point absolute value of the control signal U. You also need to cap the PWM signal at 255, as that is the maximum value we can write. Next, determine the direction by computing the sign of the control signal u. With the motor speed and direction computed from the control signal, call the set motor function to write to the motor driver. To complete the loop function, store the previous value of the error. Also, print your target and measure positions to the serial com so you can test how well your control algorithm is performing. With these parameters, I'm seeing a little overshoot after reaching the target. In other words, the motor spins too far and has to reverse directions to achieve the target position. One way to reduce overshoot is to increase the derivative term. Here I've set kd equal to 0 0.025. This is enough to completely remove the overshoot for this system. Once your system works to achieve a constant target, try setting a target that changes with time. Here I've set a sinusoidal target. Depending on your target and loading conditions, you will need to further tune your PID parameters. I hope this video helped you to understand encoders and control loops. Let me know if it did, and be sure to tell me how you're using PID control in your project in the comments below.